Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to see so many international viewers in our audience. We're so glad to see you all joining us, no matter what time it is. I know it's very early for some of you, perhaps late for those of you out in Australia. Um, but we love to switch up those time zones and uh, make these Facebook Lives at, at different times of the day so that no matter where you're located around the world, you're um, able to join us at some point for these Facebook Lives. Um, and again, a quick reminder that if you do miss a Facebook Live, uh, whether it be this one or any of our Facebook Lives, you can see them all, all the recordings for the Facebook Lives are available uh, later on the My Heritage Facebook page under the videos section. So we have uh, hundreds actually of Facebook Live uh, recordings now and uh, such great content about all different topics related to genealogy, family history, DNA uh, from various experts around the world. So a lot of amazing content available for you there, including uh, today's session. So we're really, really excited about today's session. Um, we have with us Thomas McKenty, a genealogy rock star, great friend of my heritage. Uh, we love it when he joins us. Um, and before I bring him onto the screen, I'm just gonna tell you about a draw that we'll be offering today. So we'll be giving away a My Heritage Complete Plan to one lucky viewer in the audience. Um, so if you are not aware, the My Heritage Complete Plan is the best plan we have to offer at My Heritage. It'll give you access to 15 billion historical records. That's right. We now have 15 billion historical records on My Heritage um, and counting. We add uh, millions of historical records each week on My Heritage. Uh, it will also give you unlimited family tree size for your family trees, uh, access to all the MyHeritage photo tools. So that's the MyHeritage photo enhancer, uh, MyHeritage in color, all the different photo tools that we have to offer and much, much more. So the MyHeritage Complete Plan is a fantastic gift and we are so excited to gift that to one of you. So uh, we're gonna ask an interesting question today. Um, it's something that we also asked recently on our Twitter account. Uh, we want to know what is the best kept family secret that you uncovered by doing genealogy in your family? So let us know, write us in the comment section and let us know what is uh, the best kept family secret that you discovered uh, in your family while doing your uh, genealogy research. We'd love to hear your comments in the comments section and we'll be awarding a My Heritage Complete Plan to one lucky viewer. So good luck to everyone. Um, and of course, throughout the session, please feel free to add your comments, your questions. We love hearing from you throughout the session. That's what makes these Facebook Lives so interactive and so fun. So please don't hesitate to write in the comment section or jot down a question that you may have throughout the session for Thomas. So uh, today we'll be talking about seeing your ancestors in historical context. And uh, let me add him to the screen. There we go. Hello, Thomas. Hey, Esther, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? doing well uh, the the cool weather is starting to set in here it's you know getting into the point where i need to wear pants instead of shorts and you know the summer's over it's over that well gearing up for the yeah. holidays now i guess <laughs> yeah yeah and i think you know with shipping and everything i i think that black friday is going to be in october this year and if you really want something for hanukkah or christmas you better order it now great so, advice great advice yeah. Okay, so are we ready? Yeah, that would be great. Oh, and I, um, just a reminder to everyone in the audience, we will be posting a link to Thomas's handout as well. So we'll be posting that in a few moments. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so let me make sure that I can do this. All right, I'm not sharing now. Not correct? yet. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to. Hmm. Okay. Oh, there it is. Sorry. No problem. No. Hold on. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Ah. 
we can we can just stop that and try it again if you'd like that. Yeah, I, I had to I had to remove the source, and that's no what problem. it was. Yeah, sorry about that. No you know, problem. You, you figure this out eventually. So <laughs> hold on a minute, and then uh, you should be seeing my slides right now. Correct. Perfect. Let me bring them okay. up so everyone can see. And um, there we go. So feel Great. free to take it away. Great. I really appreciate it. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas McKenty from Chicago, where many are cold, but few are frozen. Uh, I really, this is a brand new lecture for me, and I want to thank Esther for uh, suggesting it. Uh, this is one that I always wanted to add to my list of over 60 lectures. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting. So what is this thing about historical and social context? Uh, so I've been doing genealogy, some of you know, for 44 years now. Uh, yeah, it's all smoke and mirrors. I was 14 years old. I was staying with my great grandparents in a small town in upstate New York, and we were watching the miniseries Roots in February 1977, and I got hooked. And uh, so I've done a lot of research on my own families. And you know, you get the birth date, you get the death date, maybe you get a few facts, but what else is in that dash? I mean, to me, that's what makes makes it interesting. It was a short, it was the stories, it was the photos, everything in there. And so this is this lecture about this lecture is about how you can fill in that dash. Uh, some people say it's putting uh, uh, skin on the bones. Uh, of, a, of an ancestor. But I really want to know how my ancestors lived, what the conditions were like, etc. So you're going to learn a few things also to watch out about prejudices and biases. And then we're going to go over some amazing resources at the end. Uh, so why is this important? Uh, the context concept? Well, you know, I've recorded a lot of information on my grandparents, my parents, etc. Uh, but I really want to preserve a good picture of their life. Not a good picture, I shouldn't say that. A complete picture. Uh, and then that's a legacy that I'm leaving to my future generations. I do have 41 first cousins on my mother's side. Uh, good old Irish Catholic family. They didn't have television. They had kids. But I want them to have that information. So uh, when you have context, you're putting your ancestor in a very specific time and place. You know, uh, so that's the important part. That becomes the social and the historical context. Uh, how did they live? Uh, what was daily life like for them? Maybe my uh, my third great grandfather, uh, Ira Austin, who was born about I think eighteen hundred. What was life life like for him when they moved up to Lewis County in eighteen thirty, once the Erie Canal was built? And what was the quality quality of life? What constituted uh, maybe middle class, upper class, lower class? I mean, you can't use today's parameters for that. Also, I want to know how much did they spend on food? Uh, that whole historical money thing intrigues me. When I see a diary saying, you know, 1900, oh, we paid so much for a dozen eggs. I immediately am going to a calculator and figuring out what that price was today because that I can relate to. How much was it part of their income to spend on food or acquire a home? And then this is really important. There were local, national, and world events that impacted your ancestors' lives. Uh, very often we either ignore them or we're very selective about what we include. And then finally, oh, that's another duplicate. Sorry about that. Uh, the one thing before we get into this, we're going to cover some tools and then I'll go to the resource list and I'll cherry pick a few things. You have to be aware of presentism and bias. Uh, so I'm going to explain what they are if you're not familiar with them and then basically how to avoid them. Uh, you know, when we document our ancestors, I'm going to take some coffee here. You know, one of the things you have to work on is beware of presentism, that it doesn't creep in. It's so easy to do. And also, don't use your personal bias. Uh, I've talked to several genealogists, and they said, well, I didn't agree with what my great-grandfather was doing. I didn't agree with that. Uh, it went against my beliefs. And I said, well, 
that's a personal bias. Would you really want to throw out that information uh, because of your current beliefs? So that's another example. Uh, presentism. So you're introducing present day ideas and perspectives and views when interpreting the past. Uh, here's an example. Women were chattel in the United States. They were property up until I think about the 1920s. Uh, once suffrage came in and uh, women got the right to vote, that all changed. But that's how it was. Uh, same thing with slavery and enslaved ancestors. Uh, you know, I can't use modern eyes to view that. I really want to know uh, who were the uh, abolitionists? Uh, how influential were they? Uh, who were the uh, uh, holders of enslaved ancestors? All of that. Uh, but I'm going to avoid seeing it through 21st century eyes. And then bias. You know, bias can actually be personal or it can be practiced by a group or an institution. And what it is, is you're giving disproportionate weight for or against a belief, an idea or a practice. Uh, and so basically you're looking at everything you've gathered about that ancestor. And a lot of people are selective in terms of what they include. Uh, so those are the two things we really want to uh, guard against. Uh, I do a check every so often when I'm researching an ancestor and working on this context. And I say, am I interpreting this through the beliefs and practices prevalent in that time and place? That's what I want to do. Okay, more coffee. Uh, I'm going to go over some tools for discovering and sharing your ancestors' context. These are pretty straightforward, uh, but you might be surprised at some of the selections. So when it comes down to it, when we do research in genealogy and family history, we're just finding records and records basically have facts. There are very few record sets that actually give more than that. One that I can think of here in the U.S. are military pension files uh, very often or homestead files, the Homestead Act of 1862. In order to make your case to get a pension, you have to prove your service. Sometimes that was done by neighbors, by family members, giving uh, witness statements, affidavits. So you can get a pension file that's that thick. And that's really one record set that does uh, reveal all of its context. Okay, archives. Uh, more and more ar archives are opening for in-person visits, but there are some great online resources. You can hit many archives around the world and actually see if they have anything related to social and historical context or your uh, ancestor. One thing, uh, I have a lot of New York Dutch ancestry, 1641 in Schenectady near Albany, New York. So what I did is I contacted the Schenectady Historical Society uh, and they actually had online resources that helped me understood uh, what it was like to live there uh, when my ancestors arrived in 1641. Uh, books, journals, and more. This is probably one of the biggest areas where you will benefit from uh, context and getting an idea uh, of the life of your ancestors. Uh, digital books. They are all, you know, several. Google Books will go over that, Haiti Trust, uh, Internet Archive, uh, all of those. And uh, not just books. Remember that if your ancestor belonged to a, they were a Mason, a Freemason, uh, or they belonged to a fraternal organization, uh, those groups often put out yearbooks and quarterlies. And so those can be found on some of these digital sites. Now, my recommendation has always been, you want to search broad the first time. You don't want to set too many filters and make it so narrow that you don't find something. And then when you get results, maybe 500, then you can start putting filters on it and decide what you do want to look at and not look at. Business and occupation. So now there's a difference there, believe it or not. Believe it or not, when I say business, it's more of a business owner. There's a whole nother group of stuff there. Uh, if they were a business owner, they probably belong to a business organization in the city or in the town, like Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so what would you use for, also occupation would be how your ancestor earned a living, 
What did they do? What was their trade? Uh, so usually I find that in digital books, city directories, very, very important for that. Uh, if you know city directories, I think we may have covered them on a previous uh, Facebook Live, is that uh, they would list everyone alphabetically in the town. Uh, it would sometimes say what their spouse's name was. Uh, usually the mail was listed. And then also their home address and where they worked what, and where they worked and what they did, what their trade was. Uh, newspapers are also great. Uh, look for information, even advertisements for the company that your uh, ancestor worked for. Most of my ancestors uh, around 1910 and 1920 worked with the uh, uh, Central Rail Railroad in New York. And so they were teamsters. They were brakemen. They were, you know, conductors, all of that. Cemeteries. Now, you know, this can be a little bit difficult. Uh, I know a lot of us haven't picked up travel, but also would you go a thousand miles uh, just to find one, look at a grave of one ancestor who's buried. So there are sites now, sites where volunteers will take a photo, but what they don't do is you really want to see who is buried around them. Uh, and so there is an online cemetery resource, and I'll show you that towards the end. And you actually, you would look for a map and all the plots would be there. And so we'll show that off in a minute, but that's really important too. Uh, who are they buried next to? Uh, what about the cemetery? What is the history of the cemetery? Uh, how was it created, et cetera? Community, this is more than a catch-all. I was gonna call it the fan club, F-A-N, you know, stands for friends, associates, and neighbors. But it's more than that. We're talking about community of relatives and non-relatives. Uh, where did you live? Where did your ancestor live? Where did they worship uh, and how they worked? So that neighborhood picture and study that, get information. Again, city directories, diaries, letters, books, maps, and even gazetteers from the late 19th century uh, would give a good idea of, you know, what the town was like, what the city was like. Uh, let's see, I want to make sure I got it right. Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, if you get a hold of diaries and letters, either you have them or you can find them. This is probably one of the best resources because think about it. It's from their perspective. It's during that time in their life. Uh, also, also look for the diaries and letters from family members. They may talk about your ancestor and also any community members. So once you've done that community thing and you've identified the circles they ran in, then go ahead and look those people up and see if they have diaries or letters and they might men mention your ancestor. Uh, historical newspapers. Uh, there's a lot available online. My Heritage has a great collection. Uh, but again, uh, search for your ancestor, but this is one of the areas where you where presentism and bias can creep in. Uh, keep in mind here in the United States, before radio in the mid 20s or late 1920s, the main enter entertainment was newspapers. So the language is a little bit different. It's it's written, it's, it's very dramatic, uh, very flowery, some would say. Uh, it's definitely different than what you see today. Uh, so in terms of social media, mass media. Location. Uh, so this is different than community. What I'm talking about is if you know where your ancestor lived, and especially if they lived on a border, maybe it was a city border, a county border here in the U.S. is, is most common, maybe a state border or even a national border. Search over that border. I mean, those borders were a little bit more permeable uh, and they could go back and forth. Uh, more so than they did do today. Uh, so again, don't let that presentism creep in. You say, oh yeah, there's no way that they were over there in that country, even though it was five or 10 kilometers away. Uh, so that's really important. Also, we have certain locations uh, that change hands. Uh, Prussia, I mean, my German relatives, they were Prussia, they were Poland, they were all over the place. 
military service. Now, you can find those records, but as I said, you want to look for stories and accounts of their service. So the pension files are great, but believe it or not, there probably are newspaper articles uh, talking about the battles that your ancestor may have uh, fought in, uh, also books. Uh, a lot of Civil War, U.S. Civil War books, reunion books, starting in about 1870, and they'll be available on sites like Google Books, etc., Oh, timelines. I think this is one of the last ones. So this is one of the favorite things for me. Uh, I use timelines to point out when I have gaps in my research, but there are a few timeline programs out there that let you put on top of your ancestors' events, the local, national, or world events. So you can see, oh yeah, this happened when they were a teenager. This happened during their lifetime. I wonder how they, if they knew about it, I wonder how they felt about it. And those are the things that you can do through timelines and other research. Ah, oh, well, not done yet. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up the uh, handout and go through some of these resources. Uh, I want to make sure that it's, you can see it. So Esther, if you can't see this, let me know. Uh, but you should be seeing my uh, handout, correct? I think so. Uh, one of the things that I really like and that is underserved is a site called Archive Grid. And Archive Grid, basically here in the U.S., uh, it's a collection of over 7 million archival material descriptions. So it's a great way to find archives uh, and narrow it down. So, yeah, you have to go to the application Archive Grid. And, yeah, I could say, uh, I'm going to go to Chicago. Let's see, and I just spell it correctly. And so I can look at some resources here. Uh, all of this, I've got 91,000. And uh, I can look at uh, different resources, uh, different holdings. So it's really a good way to find out more about archives, especially before you make that trip. There we go. Uh, there are some articles there that I won't go over. Now, for books and journals, uh, Google Books has about 50 million digital books. And if you don't know the rule here in the U.S. for copyright, anything published before 1924 is considered in the public domain. So there's no copyright violation. And some books, even later than that, are in the public domain because the publisher didn't include the copyright statement. Uh, it, it's crazy. It's a crazy landscape to understand copyright law in the U.S. Uh, the other one, so you can go here to Google Books. Let's see if I can do this. And I'm going to do for my great-grandfather, John Ralph Austin, born 1896 in Lowville, New York. And I'm going to go ahead and say Lowville, Lewis County. Let's see what we got. Might get directories. Uh, well, we get that. Uh, these are more modern books. But when you look at this, oh, here, it's 1932 not in the public domain. This one is, and this is one that I, I have a copy of. Notice it says 1860. This is one of the classic books uh, for New York State genealogy. And here, I can actually get it here, and I can scroll through it, etc. cetera. And, uh, and that, you know, that's the way it is. And here it is, I get a description. Uh, also in Google Books, you can actually do the uh, search inside the book can add it to a library. If you have a Google account, you can build a bookshelf. Why should you have to look for this book every time? Also, there is a way to create a citation. Uh, so it really is helpful. The other one, I'm go ahead and close this. Uh, the other one is Google Scholar. That is more for articles about uh, history, sociology. Uh, so. Another example would be my Huguenots. My French Huguenots came over to New York in 1675. My ninth great grandfather's stone house built in 1699 is still standing in New Paltz, New York. So I'm going to do, uh, do I have it right? Yes. There we go. Huguenots. Yeah, we can spell correctly. Yes, thank you. And New Paltz. So, and again, we come up with, then this is in 1973, 
Uh, they might give you a preview of it, but you want to look for those books that or, or articles. Uh, so, you know, with this, you might, let's see if we can get this. Yeah, this is a book that will show up. Same issue, Google Books, but look at some of the other articles. Hold on. Okay, we'll do it again. Yeah, there it is. But here, we found an article, uh, Social and Religious History, uh, Huguenots of Colonial New Paltz, and New Rochelle is in Westchester County uh, below New Paltz, and there were a lot of Huguenots there. So sometimes you can or can't get uh, access. Here's one, The First Settlers in the Province of New York. This is by JSTOR, and I can get it for free. You know why? 1921. But it is these scholarly academic articles that really can make a difference. Uh, also, I'm not going to go over everything. Uh, definitely my heritage. There are two great areas. Now, my heritage has uh, a book collection, and uh, it's books and publications, uh, and there are tons of records in here. But also, look at this. This is the other one that I always use and have bookmarked. This is a database where you can look up authors, but also people mentioned in the books. Put in those ancestor surnames. Put in those place names if you can. And, uh, and try and find more information. See what books are out there and available. Uh, let's see. And then there's Percy. And then also there's WorldCat. If you're not familiar here in the U.S. with WorldCat, what it is is it's basically interlibrary loan. Let's say that you're, you want to get a copy of a certain book. Your local library doesn't have it. So you can actually order it through WorldCat for a nominal fee. Uh, there may be some restrictions on it, but I tend to do this uh, if I can't find the book and also before I purchase a book and spend a lot of money for it. Uh, the cemeteries. Now, two of the main sites are Finding Grave and Billion Graves. I believe Billion Graves is the one that has the maps and they will basically show you all the plots, how they're numbered in sections, uh, and then uh, actually you can fill in uh, more information if there's a name there. That gives you an idea of where they're buried, who's buried around them, uh, and that has, you know, that's part of the context that you want to include. Let's see what we got. Uh, community. So this is a mishmash, but there are a lot of uh, city directories. And again, don't forget the My Heritage City Directory Collection is astounding. Uh, 561 million records. Uh, one of the best things that I do, and I'm hoping you can see this, I'm going to look up my grandfather. And there it is. And he lived in uh, Newburgh, New York. Let's see if I can find him. Let me go ahead and search. Oh, there he is. Now, uh, so he was living at 358 Broadway. But look at this. This, I love this feature. I can see who else lived at, at that address before or after my grandfather and grandmother. Uh, that's a big one. Uh, so you want definitely want to know that. Uh, how did they come to live there? Is it a rental? Is it a home, et cetera? But uh, my heritage, that's a great part of uh, doing the community work. Uh, here we go, Internet Archive Library, My Heritage City Directories. Uh, and then don't forget, you're going to think this is crazy, uh, real estate listings. Uh, my family built a house in the Bronx, New York, in 1920. And I know the address, 24, 2482 Elm Place. Well, I had it set up as a Google alert. And guess what? The house came up for sale. And what that means these days is there's an online listing with photos of the inside of the house. Uh, so that's another thing there. Also, there is a great site called What Was There. Uh, this is a free site. And what you can do is you can find photographs that other people have posted of certain neighborhoods in certain cities. So let's see if we can find this. All right. Yeah, there's a lot there. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead here to the bull and whistle. So right here, which is in my neighborhood, a little bit south. And what you can do, oh, there we go. I 
there's just there. Hold up. We'll go here. Yeah. There's also you can view the uh, photo details. That will give you an idea of uh, when it was taken, uh, what the source is. But this is the kicker, the street view. What they've done is they've used the API uh, for Google Maps, and they've allowed people to overlay the photo. And look at this. That's basically what's there now. Uh, yeah, and that's great. That's a great way to do it. You can also upload your own photos. Uh, you do need to have an account. It's called What Was There. Uh, but the thing is, let me go back here. Let's see. Well, there it is. Uh, so it's called What Was There. It is free. Uh, but you will need to set up an account before you can upload those photos. Uh, what else? Oh, remember we talked about borders and locations. For you uh, U.S. researchers, right here. This is an amazing database. It will tell you uh, how the counties were formed over time within each state. Very often I find I'm searching in the wrong county. Uh, here's an example. My, I think my, yeah, second great grandparents were married and they were married in New York City. And I thought, well, they lived in the Bronx. They're married in February of 1912. And guess what? We go to the Bronx. Well, and we find that the county was not created until April 19th, 1912. So it makes sense that they would have to go all the way downtown to Manhattan to get a marriage license, to have the marriage done, etc. So this really keeps you on track, at least for U.S. county borders, uh, a way to do that. Uh, let's see. Military, uh, amazing collection at my heritage of military records. Uh, and basically, yeah, just... A lot and uh, while they may not give you the context that you need uh, it's a start uh, you find out uh, when your ancestor was in the military if they're involved in any battles or engagements etc uh, newspapers yeah this is probably one of the, my favorite areas of research what I have for you here are amazing newspaper resources and uh this is the other one that is brand new that i've just been using it's a new 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 database uh, almost a billion records so basically it's a name index from a lot of these free access u.s and canadian newspaper collections so that's what you want to do again remember we're going to go broad when we research so if i wanted to i could do john austin uh, and I could say, oh, maybe I'll do Ralph. That's what he went by. And then my grandmother's name, my great grandmother's name, and she was McGinnis. But I'm going to leave that out. That might be a little bit too narrow. And uh, residence was in New York. And then I can go ahead and do my search and get more information. And I, yeah, yeah, yes. Here's a little story. Uh, and you know, now this is not the one I know this is not a relative, but I would work my way all through this and try and find out, is this my Ralph Austin? Uh, abstracts, online historical newspapers, uh, one, I'll go over timelines in a minute. I do want to, uh, that's not the one I put in the wrong link. There is a group called the American Historical Association. And probably it's best to just look for them on Google. Uh, and they have societies. They call them affiliates. There we go. What it is, it, they uh, give you a whole list of uh, all of the historical societies in the U.S. Uh, so that's really uh, a good way to get started. And then you could look at their online site or go for a visit. Finally, Time Toast. Time Toast is a free timeline program. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and look at my dashboard. It's very easy to create timelines here. Uh, I have a, tons of timelines. Uh, so on a lot of things and cases. And one of the best ones I have here is my Henneberg line. Uh, 
Gustav Hindenburg came over from Germany in 1891. And see, I start building his timeline. Uh, it's very easy to, you put in the date, put in the heading. You can even look at this. So in June 5th, 1917, that would have been the first draft of World War I for U.S. citizens. And he filled out a card and it said he was working as a driver for Jay Smith at 62 Teller Avenue, Bronx, New York. Also, look at what a good boy I am. I have my source citation. Uh, and you upload the photo. The photo may not be very clear. Oh, there's a better, better one. But this is great. The other thing is you can share this timeline with other people. You can also print it to PDF. It's great for looking for those gaps. Here's an example. New York State had uh, state censuses. In 1905, I got that one. In 1915, where's the record? And 1925, so I know I have my work to do. And then you can actually go ahead and start, I believe, adding those uh, those historical events as well. Uh, so Time Toast is my go-to timeline program. I know a lot of uh, genealogy sites uh, do a timeline, but you have to have all that information in the family tree first. This one is independent. Uh, and it's very easy to use, uh, no programming needed. And so that is one of the ones that I use a lot. Uh, I think we're pretty much set here. I'm going to close this and go back to my slides. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I may seem a little bit tired than I am. It's early for me. Uh, but you can always reach me at highdefgen at gmail.com uh, if you have questions about this topic. Uh, keep in mind that I get about three or 400 emails a day. And so it may take me two days to get back to you. So Esther, how was that? All right. You there? Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I stopped, um, I, I stopped my share. So I turned everything over to you. Great. Great. No, that was fantastic. Um, I see Teresa wrote here some of these I never heard of. Thank you for sharing all of this. Yeah. Um, and a lot of comments here about people who haven't heard. I, you always bring in all these resources that people aren't aware of, and they're just so helpful. I, I yeah. love um, and I love that. Uh, what was here? Site. What was there? What was there? No. Yeah, it's similar to History Pin. History Pin is from the UK and they came out first. Uh, and also look for collections. Uh, History Pin will have a World War One collection, and so they'll have photos and stories. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, Renee said that is a lot of emails, and and I agree. And and answering three to four hundred emails within two days sounds amazing. <laughs> you well, know, a lot of them are junk, and a lot of them don't need responding to. So I try and run a triage every morning when I wake up. So yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, we do have a couple questions, if you don't mind, uh, that we'll take. And anyone who hasn't put a question in, if you have any for Thomas, please let us know. Um, so let's see. Uh, Renee said, um, does my heritage have books that were published after 1924? I don't think so, because that would violate copyright here in the U.S. Now, one thing you can do, remember I showed you Google Books? On some books, the author will allow a preview. The preview might be 10 pages, but it might be those 10 pages you need. See what I'm saying? So always look through the listings. If it says uh, you must purchase or not available, then they're not providing it at all. No, I don't think that my heritage has any that are after 1924. Okay, uh, we have a question here from... Um... Joan, she asks, is Billion Graves only for the U.S.? Uh, I don't think so. Let's go into, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen again, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. yeah. And let me go ahead here and do Billion Graves. I know I have an account, but the best thing is, yeah, there it is, uh, is to look at their about. And uh, hmm. uh, about us. Yeah, I believe it's worldwide. Yeah, worldwide. Uh, so that's what it is. I remember when they started. I, I know some of the team that started this up. Uh, and it's not quite like Find a Grave. Uh, they have a better app. 
Uh, and, you know, they have a whole community that they've built up. There's also something called Pil Billion Grace Plus, which is a subscription uh, for their site. But uh, Billion Grace is, uh, it is worldwide. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Beverly asks, does my heritage have a lot of Canadian records? Yeah, I think so, relatively. I mean, they may not have as many as the Library and Archives of Canada, but no, they do. And and one bias that I do know on this presentation, it's very US-centric. Uh, and that was not necessarily on purpose, but that's where most of my research I'm familiar with. Uh, so like the Atlas of Historical County Boundaries, if you're looking in the UK, look for something similar. Uh, and so you have to do a Google search, say, you know, how do I determine when uh, an area's borders were defined? So. Okay, we have a question here yeah. from Ellen, and she says, can you search for an address in city directories? Would love to know who lived in the house before my grandparents. See, this is why I can only do it on my heritage, because my heritage is smart enough to index the address. So that means you can search on it. Remember that feature, who else lived at this address? Now, the other thing is you could go out to Google and put in the address and then the word city directory and see what you find. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, that's very useful, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, let's see. I think that's it for the question. Okay. Okay. Let's so draw get, for a prize. Let's draw yeah, for a prize. Yeah. My favorite part. My favorite part of the whole of the so, session. So what was it? They, they had to disclose a family secret that they discovered. Yeah. And we, you know, oh, we okay. received some really, really great ones. Um, I'll read a few of the runners up. <laughs> okay. okay. Sure. Um, we received some really, really nice ones. Um, Rihanna said, I can trace my genealogy back to Tahiti, but I am born and bred in New Zealand, 17 generations via the migration of the Pacific. However, our DNA takes us back to Taiwan. So I guess that was a surprise for um, for her and her family. Let's see. We, uh, we received some really nice ones. Um, well, so, I, have one, I do have one. And let's this, hear. Well, it, my great grandparents, salt of the earth, conservative as can be, helped raise me. They said that their marriage date was May 30th, 1915. Now I think it's funny that there are no photos of the wedding. I go ahead and do the research. Oh, the license wasn't taken out until July 29th, and they weren't married until August 8th. And already I'm counting on my fingers how many months until their first child is born. Yeah, basically. They, uh, they fudged the marriage date to cover the pregnancy. Uh, they would be rolling in their graves. The fact that I even know this, uh, but in a way it endears them more to me. It makes them more human in a way. Uh, so yeah, that was the one that I had. That was the, I never knew until they both passed away, so. And it's also, you know, it also has to do with what we spoke about today, about seeing your ancestors in the context exactly. of, of society yeah. and, yeah. you know, why they would have to do that in those times. Yeah, well, we, we think that it's more common in modern days, but you would be surprised how many clients I find in the same situation, you know, where they basically fudged on the date uh, to cover a pregnancy. Yeah. So interesting. Um, who else, yeah. Who else has a story? Um, let's see. We have, um, Diana. Diana said, I found my first, I found for my first cousins, their full sister who had been adopted from the family 60 years earlier. Um, and they were able to meet each other in person. So that's yes. such a nice story, Diana. That's lovely. What a great, yes. what a great mystery and discovery to those find. Are, those are like the DNA reunion stories that my heritage runs. I always love those. Amazing. Yeah. They're just incredible. Um, so let's uh, let's choose a winner. So okay. uh, even though they're all so nice and, and we loved reading about the different things that you've all discovered. So thank you everyone for uh, putting those comments in there. Um, and our winner today is Cornelia Mueller. And Cornelia wrote us and she said, I have my mom's diary from her SS Europa trip westbound in 1938. The ship wow. circled for three days before the ship was allowed to proceed to New York. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here. <laughs> wow, that's great. Uh, and so you might want to mention people are asking where the handout is and how they can get that. 
Yeah. yeah, so we did put a link in the comment section um, and you can just scroll up and you'll see, we'll put another link near the bottom as well to the handout for anyone who missed it. Um, but Tom has created just a, a lovely handout with so many links and resources for you all to, to take yeah. a look at. So, and you remember, uh, Esther, my whole thing is actionable genealogy education. You can take this handout a day from now, a week from now, a year from now, and you'll still have it available to go and check those resources. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So um, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Cornelia will be in touch with you through private message yes. to claim your amazing prize. Um, and Thomas, thank you so much for joining us so sure. early in the morning well, over there. I know, thank you for the opportunity and also for putting this idea in my head. Uh, you know, it's not often that you ask for something to be created, but this is a great opportunity. And I appreciate oh, it. I'm so glad. I'm so yeah. glad. And and we're really the lucky ones for having you join okay. us. <laughs> okay. Well, bye everyone. Have a, Have great, a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. bye.